Hi, good afternoon. On behalf of the Biochemical Society and Portland Press, I am pleased to welcome you to this webinar, which is part of our biochemistry Focus webinar series. The topics in this series include different research areas in the biomolecular, in the molecular biosciences, as well as some practical sessions to support career development. And each webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions via text, and we welcome any suggestions for future topics and speakers to fe feature in our webinar series. Please take a look at the website for more details. So I'm Helen Walden, Professor of Structural Biology at the University of Glasgow, and it is my pleasure to chair today's webinar that's titled Structure, Dynamics and Function of the 26S Proteasome. So the 26X protea 26S proteasome is a very complex ATP-dependent protease, which is required to selectively degrade ubiquitin conjugated proteins, and as such plays fundamentally indispensable roles in regulating almost all cellular processes. It's got a lot of jobs to do, has to coordinate a lot of substrate selectivity and processing to achieve this regulation. And the inner working of the 26S proteasome is among one of the most sophisticated mechanisms uh, that we have in eukaryotic cells. So questions will be asked uh, at the end of the webinar, but please do send in your questions during the talk. Um, if you have a question, please type it in the question box as shown in the image on the screen stating who your question is for. So our invited speaker today is Dr. Yudong Mao, who is currently a tenured associate professor of biological physics and cryo cryoelectron microscopy at the School of Physics and Center for Quantitative Biology at Peking University in Beijing. He's also a senior scientist and principal investigator at the Intel Parallel Computing Center for Structural Biology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, um, the hospital teaching hospital affiliated to Harvard Medical School in the US. Dr. Mao obtained his PhD in condensed matter physics from Peking University in 2005, then spent two years at the National Center for Nanoscience and Technology in Beijing. After that, he then joined the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute as a postdoc fellow in 2007. He then joined the faculty of Harvard Medical School as an instructor in 2012, became the principal investigator and director of the Parallel Computing Center, in 2014 and began his independent research lab at Peking University in 2015. His lab is dedicated to the development of computational and experimental methods analyzing highly dynamic protein machines, including the proteasome. And he has pioneered the applications of deep learning in improving cryo-EM data processing pipelines and has determined numerous high resolution uh, cryo-EM structures and lots of conformational dynamics of the human 26S proteasome. So I'm really looking forward to hearing about his work. And with that, I would like to hand over to Dr. Mao. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Helen. Um, uh, can I start to share my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon uh, to uh, UK uh, people and uh, good morning for, for US people. Uh, so uh, before I start my uh, short webinar, I'd like to briefly uh, acknowledge uh, and express my appreciation to Professor uh, Robin Harris, uh, who actually invited me to write the uh, chapter for uh, his amazing book uh, named Macromolecular Protein Complex 3, Structure and Function, which is currently showed a slide on the right. And it's actually, he proposed, uh, pro recommended me to uh, give this uh, webinar. Uh, I uh, really appreciate the uh, Biochemical Society to uh, give me the opportunity to discuss uh, our most recent studies on the proteasome structure and function. So our current slide is just briefly uh, kind of recoup you the idea of uh, where does about uh, of the proteasome had is actually 
uh, on what it's actually at the end of many uh, a huge number of eukaryotic nation pathway. So we know that a proteasome uh, is the major uh, molecular machine that's doing ADP independent uh, selective substrate degradation. So these kind of substrate as show in the uh, red um, structure has to be first uh, modified by ubiquitin, uh, either as monoubiquitin or polyubiquitin through a cascade of E1, E2, and E3 enzymes. So uh, there's whole lots of studies uh, around E1, E2, and E3. And in fact, the discovery of the ubiquitination pathway centered around E1, around E1 E2, and E3 enzymes were recognized uh, by Nobel Prize in chemistry of 2004 uh, to three uh, scientists. Uh, so in terms of structure, what are we uh, really curious about and what is really fascinating about this uh, molecular machine is that it's actually combining uh, many different functions. So as I show in the current slide that, as you can see that, uh, the proteasome has a, a core particle that is uh, mainly responsible for breakdown of polypeptides. But we know that protein has to be folded very well to be functional. So uh, prior to polypeptide degradation, and proteasome has to recognize ubiquitinated substrate. So that got to be something called a ubiquitin receptor. So currently we know that there are at least the three uh, uh, ubiquitin receptors, RPN1, RPN10, uh, and RPN13 in each of the uh, regulatory complex that's attached uh, at either end of the CP or both end of the CP. And in the meantime, the, uh, the machine has to unfold the substrate. So it is actually embedded with a, a triple ATPase module that is function as an amphodase, that's uh, hydrolyzed ATP and harvest ATP hydrolysis, uh, chemical energy to uh, mechanically unfold the substrate. So uh, in the meantime, as you know, that once the ubiquitin has been recognized and it's um, ATP is engaged with substrate, uh, the ubiquitin uh, modification has to be reversed in order to allow processive uh, substrate processing. So as you can see that this molecular machine is an elegant coupling combination of several different uh, machineries. So there are ubiquitin receptor, the ubiquitinase, and uh, ATP amphodase, uh, and the protease. Uh, so there are many functions uh, to just to name a few, that is actually uh, proteasome is at the center of regulating uh, cell cycle, for example, and um, some of the tumorogenesis, apoptosis, and uh, immune uh, response. Uh, so uh, apparently there's also many other potential functions to be discovered, and it's hardly to be included in one slide. This is just a uh, give you a short kind of recoup. Uh, so my lab basically we're trying to deal with this highly dynamic uh, kind of complex machinery that's uh, composed of uh, several different or many different enzymes into a hollow enzyme. So we were uh, trying to develop query electron microscopy uh, to visualize complex dynamics. Um, so just to remind you what, what is the EM, so basically the idea is we kind of purify the protein and in using uh, a cryoplunging uh, flash frozen procedure to freeze them into very thin layer of ice. Normally it's about 20 to 50 nanometer and then put them into the transmission microscope under cryogenic condition and record images using uh, currently right now uh, Core directly electron detector uh, to create these 
a large number of image stacks. Of course, if you can actually uh, extract all images that's random oriented uh, macromolecular particles, you can use computation approach to sort them out into different orientation, and then uh, you can potentially reconstruct this structure. And if you even have more powerful algorithm that can analyze the conformational chains, so theoretically you can also uh, solve the complex dynamics, but because of today's uh, webinar is really about proteasome, so I'm gonna uh, save it for future discussion about uh, the algorithm development uh, in my lab. So we're, we're gonna just jump into uh, what are the end results of all these uh, methodology development. So about five years ago, uh, we actually first determined the, uh, the proteasome structure in the absence of substrate uh, in the presence of ATP. So at that point, the PNAS paper reported uh, with four conformations and that's uh, spontaneously sampled by the proteasome is called SA, SB, SD, and SD states. So SA still went to uh, about 3.8 angstrom, and it turned out that's a resting state. Um, and there's only state, state SD showing the open gate of a CP core particle. Uh, so we, in 2018, uh, we kind of published another study by replacing ATP entirely with ATP gamma S. And it turned out these single states, it's not a single state, it's actually composed of at least the three uh, substates called SD1, SD2, SD3. So these three states mainly differ uh, in their ATPase motor uh, uh, module. Uh, so um, how the, the proteasome regular particle actually uh, translocates substrate and the first is we look at the sub potential substrate translocation channel in the, in the triple ATPA sample days, because that's the most interesting part. Or say the first of, uh, uh, part that's going to stably engage with substrate uh, unfolded uh, region. Uh, so if we look at this architecture, it's very interesting that the, uh, each of the ATPA subunit contribute uh, two pore loops called pore one, pore two loop. And in the default state, in the resting state, they actually form two kinds of uh, super helical uh, architecture as just waiting there. But however, if you look at the real structures, the, uh, the center of triple A channel is so lateral that such it has to open to accommodate uh, the substrate insertion. So that's going to be showing later. So uh, to briefly summarize, uh, the proteasome structure in the absence of substrate, I'm gonna use a movie to show it. So this movie basically is uh, assembled from the three SD state. So from SD1 change to SD2, then from SD2 change to SD3. So these basically are the three states almost equally spontaneous sampled um, in the presence of gamma S and in the absence of substrate. So it shows that the, uh, the proteasome is in constant motion, um, even you don't give it anything, right? So, so that's the, uh, the word before uh, 2018, but in fact, uh, starting from uh, 2017, uh, uh, trivirus uh, kind of, uh, started all various experiments try to uh, figure out how to assemble a substrate and capture substrate bound proteasome. So uh, because of a limited time, I'd like to jump to the major kind of uh, principle or say the conclusion is what we, what is shown in the current slide and we published in 2019. So the really interesting part is of the discovery, I will explain a little bit more in detail uh, in next 10 to 15 minutes is we found that the ATPase motor is actually almost control nearly everything about the proteasome function. And it's shown 
as three modes. So as you can see, the first dash nine box is the first mode uh, that we uh, uh, is regulating uh, ubiquity binding and the ubiquity nation. So as you can see that uh, this mode is featured by kind of uh, ADP hydrolysis uh, in two subunits that's just opposite each other. You can see the, the green uh, molecule is the ADP and the red molecule uh, here binding to the uh, ATPase nucleotide pocket uh, is the red one is ATP. So you can see the ATP hydrolysis into ADP is kind of uh, take, taking place in the two opposite ATPase. Uh, while in the state EB, it's very similar, but it's rotated uh, like uh, counterclockwise um, by just one uh, subunit. And then uh, there's a second mode. And this second mode is different from first one is because what we see is two, two uh, laboring subunits uh, kind of hydrolyzing ATP, ADP at the same time, but not, or exchanging at the same time, but uh, do not really uh, uh, propagate uh, down to the uh, ATPase ring. So in this case, um, what we see is actually it's regulating, uh, uh, potentially regulating the translocation of the uh, translocation initiation and the ubiquity release, as well as the safety gate opening. So it's kind of doing multiple things at the same time. So once the, uh, the core particle gate is open, uh, then we believe as many other liter uh, uh, literatures uh, or publications illustrated that uh, it looks like there's only one uh, ATPase is hydrolyzing at the same at a at a time at a one. Then uh, it's kind of doing exchanging of the uh, nucleotide. So then these kind of modes is, uh, uh, rotate around ATPS ring and uh, potentially uh, going around in, in a circle. Uh, but uh, what's interesting for the proteasome is somehow we just didn't see the other uh, four possibilities. That's why I uh, put a question mark here. Uh, and we will briefly talk about why that's the case. Uh, so, um, so that's the kind of a uh, major discovery, but to really understand why that's the case and associated to the function, we actually uh, kind of have to roll back a little bit. Uh, so these kind of mechanism somehow could potentially address nearly all these questions, or at least a, a majority of these questions, for example, uh, how many conformers can this can this uh, molecular machine really sample in solution in the presence of substrate? Um, how the ATPS channel is open for substrate engagement, and how the uh, how does ATP hydrolysis regulate uh, substrate engagement and the ubiquitin nation? And how does ATPase initiate a substrate translocation? And how the uh, chemical energy of ATP hydrolysis uh, used to unfold the substrate uh, protein, um, as well as how is the substrate processing regulated uh, intrinsically, uh, somehow can all be uh, kind of gleaned from uh, what I just showed you, the three modes. Uh, so if we just change a little bit angle, look at this whole thing, look at uh, if you say that's compare the energy, uh, free energy landscape. Well, the free energy landscape is actually pretty complicated as we show uh, in the bioarchive paper, with, which I was not able to talk about here because in the process of formal publication. Uh, but I draw here as a kind of schematic uh, or conceptual comparison is actually uh, easier to, to read, easier to look at. So uh, without substrate, which I show uh, for ATP or um, as the red curve, red free energy profile. And for substrate free state with ATP gamma, as I uh, show as orange dashed uh, profile. 
Uh, and if you add the substrate, then it's kind of the whole landscape is changed uh, and becomes much more rugged, much more rugged. So you can see the acid state is kind of split into multiple states. Uh, the acid state become EA1 and EA2 and EB state. And also uh, for the other remaining states, they kind of remain, but uh, if you look at our latest publication, it's not just the four states here, it's uh, almost a 10 states, even more here. Uh, so that gives the idea that how these, uh, the landscape of substrate uh, by, uh, of the proteasome before and after substrate interaction. So then how we can capture them. So we, based on this uh, understanding, we devised the strategies called uh, nucleotide substitution. So that uh, idea is very simple. Uh, we basically feed the substrate with ATP and substrate, then put the timer on, uh, count on 30 seconds. After 30 seconds, we exchange uh, in which uh, that deplete or replace ATP with ATP gamma S. So once you replace the ATP gamma S, after 30 seconds of degradation reaction, you kind of freeze everything, every potential in the media states in the middle of a uh, reaction. So that's kind of how we uh, uh, did it in terms of trap the substrate engaged uh, human proteasome. Uh, so uh, indeed, uh, this strategy works to the effect. It's not just to capture some of the state, to our surprise, is capture almost uh, any states you could imagine. And definitely it's beyond our initial kind of speculation, what could be a trap. Uh, so then the outcome, uh, this is just, I uh, mean, uh, I would say a little bit of solid data because it's in 2019 uh, and the manuscript was put out in the bioarchive uh, two months ago, uh, included uh, almost 20 com uh, conformers for RP, a single RP and a single CP subcomplex. And we are also able to reconstruct the uh, complete pure double cap and differentiate it from uh, the single cap. Um, but all those are based on, somewhat based on the current seven states. Um, so the seven states, as you can see, that can be understood into four phase. The first phase, first step, it's ubiquitin binding, right? It has the, the protein has to first recognize ubiquitin, uh, then try to do some uh, structure change to prepare for deubiquitination. So that's the second step. And after the ubiquitination, it has to smoothly transit into uh, initiation of translocation and try to control the four particles, say, well, uh, open the gate, right? So then after the gate is open, uh, the, uh, it's supposed to go into a phase, into a phase that's, uh, that, that is processively uh, degrade a substrate. So uh, what is interesting is that you can uh, still see on this slide, the, there's a major kind of feature, as you can see, in the absence of substrate, the largest population is the last A state. Uh, but when you add a substrate, the largest the state, the, uh, which you also see in the particle population, is instead the ED2 state, which is the uh, substrate engaged and in the middle of uh, processing translocation and with the core particle gate open. Um, so that's a, a very dramatic kind of conformational change um, and as well as the a change, dynamic change of the free energy landscape. Uh, so these slides just give you a brief a kind of uh, overview of uh, three of the typical uh, structure uh, in the most uh, uh, important functional step of uh, uh, the translocation initiation and process of translocation. And you can see the uh, in the uh, EB state, uh, which is actually doing the deubiquitination uh, work, where we can really see the isopeptide bond between uh, the ubiquitin uh, molecule and the substrate. Um, and in, in the state EC, you can see that the uh, 
the isopeptide bond is somehow has been cleaved. So uh, apparently the ubiquitin has detached from the substrate, while the substrate is kind of going free into deeper uh, in the ATP ATP ring. Um, and in the uh, ED2 state, uh, the ubiquitin on the, the ubiquitin is it's even released. It's gone because uh, we don't need it anymore, <laughs> right? Uh, so the substrate kinds of go into uh, kind of processive translocation modes. Um, and in the meantime, you will see that a whole uh, regenerative particle um, kind of undergo dramatic conformation or change we will show in the, uh, another movie. So I just briefly kind of go through uh, some of the local densities where show uh, in some of the states, for example, the EA actually will reconstruct it to pretty good resolution where you can even uh, see the alanine um, uh, residue side chain somehow. Uh, also, the ED2 is not too bad. And you, you really can tell many of the uh, moderate size, uh, even some of the small size of side chains. Uh, so that um, uh, most prominently um, um, is that we can see the single magnesium ion um, in the EA state uh, around ATP, um, and also uh, occasionally can see the magnesium ice even on ADP. Um, so, uh, so this is so these these are the very interesting structures. What it, if you look at it very closely to the ATPase, uh, what the structures show is that uh, in in current slide that ADP is that we basically we fixed orientation of ATPase and just look at how ADP or say nucleotide state change. Actually, what is interesting is the, you can see that in EA1 state, the ADP is uh, at the top most uh, subunit. And this ADP is kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, the hydrolyzed ADP is kind of moved counterclockwise, then in the EB state, you'll see the ADP uh, show um, in, the in the adjacent subunit, and it's a moving, and, and so apparently the, a and the ADP state kind of navigating throughout the whole ring. You see the, uh, on the rightmost the, uh, panel, the ED2 state, the ADP is actually rotating to uh, a clockwise labor, uh, labor and stability um, of the uh, ADP in the EA uh, one state. So what is shown is the four cycle of ADP hydrolysis that's navigating uh, through all six uh, hardware uh, hexamer subunits. So that's a very interesting observation. And the second important, or say, uh, another very prominent uh, observation is that these uh, around the ring nucleotide hydrolysis uh, navigation is strongly coupled with the substrate interaction as shown in the lowest panel. So you can see that the pore loop is kind of doing the kind of uh, uh, stepping work. Uh, Probably it's a little bit kind of, you have to sit down to look at this. You see the, uh, the green uh, uh, tyrosine residues. It's the, uh, the residue that's contacting the substrate made chain from the pore one loop. And this green uh, uh, residue, uh, the tyrosine is kind of moving down. You see that uh, in the EC1, two state, it's moving down by like uh, around two uh, residue on the substrate and it's moving down uh, continuously in ED, ED1 and further down in ED2. So the outcome is during this, uh, this four cycle of around the ring ADP hydrolysis, these uh, green uh, tyrosine residues moving from the top to the bottom. So, uh, and that's solely driven by uh, the uh, ADP hydrolysis. So the uh, the current slide, the lower right panel, is the uh, uh, diagram showing the pore loop stepping system that I just explained. Um, 
So that's a uh, look at a movie. I'll uh, see how these seven structure kind of, uh, when they connect it together, uh, how it looks like. So this movie would not based on uh, molecular dynamic simulation. It's based on seven cryom uh, structures and just connect them into a movie, right? So there's no other simulation done for uh, this movie. As you can see, the Appian 1 has like 45 degree rotation, then the substrate inserting the ATPase uh, channel, and there's a large rotation, and then release the ubiquitin. Uh, then the ATPase uh, move again and drag this whole thing, uh, the red substrate, into uh, the CP channel. So that's uh, so that's the uh, the seven structures. Of, so we come back to these uh, uh, three modes. Let's go through uh, each mode uh, to look at a little bit more details. Uh, so the first mode, uh, so the first mode is summarized in the current slide as I just uh, talked about in the absence of substrate, the triple ATPase channel is actually in a closed state. Uh, although it's shown uh, in, in a super helical kind of uh, arrangement um, that looks like it's ready to accept the substrate, but it's just there's no enough space. So uh, what happens is that we found that uh, the ADP uh, bond to RPT6 kind of has to be released in the state EB in order to open the central tributary channel. Uh, so we then we compare the uh, the triple ATPase uh, structure between uh, states EB and EA, as you can see, the uh, EB is colored um, for each of the subunit, and EA was shown as gray. And you can see that um, the colored uh, the, um, the colored structure, uh, particularly the pore loop that's interacting with the substrate, kind of all kind of move out, right? Move out a little bit. Uh, then uh, the largest uh, movement is in RPT6, that is almost like it's kind of leaping uh, out. Uh, if you go closer to the structure, what happens is uh, in the EA state, you have kind of very tight interface between RPT and its uh, two neighboring subunit. Uh, but then in the EB state, uh, ADP is kind of released um, the RPT6 kind of form a uh, very uh, low, noticeable marked um, kind of gap uh, at RPT3, RPT6 interface, and RPT2, RPT6 interface. Um, then in the later step, you start to see this kind of interface is kind of close uh, one at a time. Right, so uh, first uh, there's RPT6, RPT3 to RPT6 interface is closed in the C1 state, while the other interface is still uh, kind of wide open. And in the D1 state, then both uh, were closed. Uh, so if you really look at even closer to uh, the RPT6 uh, structure, uh, there's a noticeable refolding because there's, a, as you can see, that uh, dashed. Uh, green cur curve is actually corresponds to an order structure which is well resolved in EB state, but it's uh, but in EA, this uh, dashed segment of uh, structure is kind of disordered. So there's a, apparently after the nucleotide uh, is released uh, from the RPT6, uh, these kind of uh, sl slighted Disorders of transiting the well ordered structure. Uh, also, you can see part of the other structures also refold. Um, so, that's a very uh, interesting and prominent uh, feature. Also, as you can see, that um, if you compare the RPT6 um, uh, ATPA uh, structure between the five different states, uh, only this APO state, which is shown as the purple one, where, where you see a large uh, kind of uh, rotational change between 
uh, small AAA and large AAA subdomain. Well, the, the other four structure are always ADP or ATP bond. And actually, it's kind of quite comparable, except except for uh, the large AAA domain where uh, some of the poor loop uh, is kind of uh, looping areas kind of having dramatic uh, refolding. Um, so that's the, uh, and in the meantime, uh, this kind of mode one also regulate uh, the ubiquitin recognition. Um, so this is just shows you that uh, two uh, highly occupied uh, ubiquitin um, recognition sites, one is on RPN1 and the uh, between the T1, T2 sites, and the other is uh, between RPN11 and RPT4 and 5 coil coil. So you can see that uh, in the EA1, um, uh, there's two ubiquitin kind of how around the coil, uh, coil, coil. Um, one of the ubiquitins kind of move close to the RPN11 in the EA2 state, and it's even more tightly inserted uh, in the EB state to prepare uh, uh, the ubiquitin for the ubiquitination. So if we rotate the whole structure and almost 90 degree, then uh, if we magnify uh, the local structure where the uh, isopeptide bond sits, you can really see uh, uh, the isopeptide bond is well linked between the substrate um, and uh, the ubiquitin C terminals. And what's also interesting is uh, there's a kind of unstructured loop in most of the other uh, structures, uh, we, which we call RPT5 end loop. So this end loop. It's well ordered and it's participating to form a four strand beta sheet that's kind of orienting the isopeptide bond for the ubiquitination. However, this RPT5 end loop is kind of missing in all the other states. And we also know that this RPT5 end loop uh, is highly conserved across East uh, to human. So we were one, we were scratching our hand uh, when we saw this first structure, why uh, both yeast and human proteasome has to have these kind of end loop that's kind of extra long and kind of doing nothing and not assuming any uh, meaningful structures, uh, but not until we see uh, this EB state uh, and explains why it has to be there. Uh, so just briefly mention that in this structure, uh, we also have strong evidence of uh, the catalytic zinc ion uh, in RPM 11 active site. Uh, so that means that the whole structure is in, is in a state that is fully active, uh, fully active. So, okay, let's move to the mode two. Uh, so the mode two, I would just uh, go slightly quicker. Uh, so basically what it does is a uh, three, th things at the same time. One thing is move the substrate forward uh, by, uh, uh, as together would be, I would say, uh, one uh, one step forward, then uh, release the ubiquitin and also trigger the CP gating. So uh, what what is about a CP gate opening that is interesting is uh, it's triggered by the C-terminal tail of uh, five ATPAs, uh, five ATPases. Um, but in EA, EB, and EC, and ED state, we see different patterns of the C-terminal tail insertion into the uh, surface pockets of the alpha ring, um, which is actually illustrated in, uh, uh, in a cartoon in the lower row, um, that what, is, what it is showing is um, there's one more C-tail inserted into the um, Alpha ring at a time when it moves from a one state to the down to the nearest the downstream state. For example, the EA1 to EB state, you got RPT2 C tail uh, inserted. Then you move down to the EC state, you got RPT6 C, C terminal tail inserted. Then if you move down to further down to ED state, the RPT1 uh, C terminal tail is inserted. Then this our central gate is open. So that's a very interesting kind of synchronized observation that is kind of 
shown the proteasome is rigorously uh, regulated by uh, allosteric effects. Uh, then let's look at the MOV3. So the, uh, the MOV3 looks like uh, it's much simpler because what it's shown is uh, three kind of neighboring subunit kind of synchronize their uh, nucleotide processing. Uh, so as you see in the uh, uh, in the forest green uh, subunit, uh, this uh, it's undergoing ATP hydrolysis. Then uh, it's clockwise uh, adjacent subunit is doing kind of ADP release, and while uh, the further down uh, adjacent subunit uh, is doing ATP binding. So basically, what happens? The three uh, kinds of nucleotide processing were synchronized around a ring, around half of the ring. Uh, well, it's one is doing ATP hydrolysis, the second one is doing ATP release, the third one is doing ATP binding. Uh, that's a very interesting thing to look at. Uh, uh, of course, uh, these process, uh, which which step is faster, which step is slower, uh, it couldn't be seen uh, in in this uh, two structure. But I can tell you that in uh, if you look at our uh, latest about uh, our paper, we kind of have have the lucky kind of chance to resolve six states. Uh, during single nucleotide exchange, uh, where we start to look at which step is fattest, which step is the slowest, and it tells you more about uh, intrinsic coordination of, uh, during uh, the structure transition. Uh, so, the, from the at least from the EB state to ED2 uh, for RPT5, we can really see that. Uh, a single nucleotide is undergo three phase, three types of processing. First is hydrolyzed, then ADP released, and then uh, this pocket is rebinds ATP. So it's kind of four cycle of uh, ADP hydrolysis and exchange. And then you can measure uh, the conformation of change over the, over the, uh, the whole process. Uh, so what we see is that, like, for example, uh, uh, there's large uh, kind of uh, flipping out, um, kind of out of the way flipping um, in the RPT5 ATPase. It's almost flipped like a 30 degree um, when it transited from ED1 to ED2, which corresponds to ATP binding procedure. So ATP binding is kind of uh, um, Sorry, uh, it's kind of doing the things that moving this whole ATP uh, small triple A against the large triple A or vice versa. Uh, so it's very similar to what we see in RPT6 subunit. If you look, if you compare the five states of RPT5, uh, it's only the uh, apple like state, uh, which, which in this case is ED1. Um, that's shown almost 25 degree of rotation between the small and large AAA subdomain, while uh, the other four states uh, either bond with ATP or ATP. Um, they, they show very similar uh, structures. Uh, so which means that it's, uh, it's, the, it's the process of ATP release or say nucleotide exchange um, give rise to the most dramatic uh, intrinsic uh, motion in the ATPase. So that's actually how uh, kind of power stroke were generated as shown uh, in the current cartoon uh, that uh, the ones that's releasing the ADP is actually once it's released, it's kind of the whole ADP is going to become very flexible intrinsically so it could, could rotate 30 degree. Uh, then uh, after this kind of uh, nucleotide release, when it actually binds the uh, uh, ATP is actually going to make the whole ATP has become more rigid, and in, in which case it only trigger like uh, seven degree motion uh, overall. Uh, but this kind of motion when they kind of combine together is enough to generate mechanical force uh, to uh, move the substrate uh, 
towards the core particles. Uh, so that's brought to another movie that uh, showed uh, more intimately how these ATPAs kind of doing the nucleotide exchange um, and drag the substrate forward. Okay, so um, so this is the EB state, and that's the at the very beginning. Um, then um, the EC EC one state. Uh, it's just about to start to uh, move the substrate forward. And EC2, the whole thing kind of move a, a, above the core particle. Then the ED1 state. So you can see the pore loop actually uh, grab these substrates very tightly, uh, but uh, in the EC1, EC2, there's two uh, pore one loop uh, dissociated from the substrate, but in the in both ED1, ED2, uh, only one uh, pore one loop uh, dissociated from the substrate. Um, so that's connect the whole thing uh, together and look at it more. how the substrate were translocated. Okay, so it's the same as the previous movie that uh, we did not do any molecular dynamic, dynamic simulation. We just connect the uh, these structures together and just uh, uh, that them to play. Uh, so the current slides basically kind of expands the idea of the three modes and because uh, the previous we only showed ATPase but in fact, the change of late TPH conformation is kind of doing things in both ways. Uh, it strongly affects the, uh, the core particles conformation as well as the surrounding of uh, lead subunit. Uh, so the lead subunit actually you can see that the uh, lead subcomplex sitting above the ATPAs module is contacting the sub uh, the ATPAs ring in different sides. So that that kind of interaction probably is kind of provide a strong um, constraint on how uh, these ATPase ring uh, kind of rotate um, doing ADP hydrolysis around a ring and why we kind of see uh, ED1, ED2 states more frequently while not see other uh, four potential states uh, clearly. Uh, it's probably because it's changed, making these two states much more stable through the lead base interaction. Well, the other four states kind of objectively disfavored, but probably still sampled, but it's very quickly, extremely quickly, that we probably won't be able to capture them at all uh, at this point, unless we have some other strategies. Last slide is trying to kind of stimulate some of the thoughts is uh, what's the future? What's the immediate future and the longer term future? So we kind of look at, um, at three different uh, directions. Um, why is that uh, how to characterize conformational landscape of ubiquity signals required for proteosome targeting? And try to understand how these uh, ubiquity signals interact with the ubiquitin receptors in the context of proteosome. And that's very important and very difficult <laughs> job to do. And um, also, uh, in fact, if you look at these two things, uh, there's many things could happen in between, uh, in between uh, proteos protein eucodination and proteosome mediated degradation. And also, uh, since now we can actually uh, image this uh, very sophisticated uh, molecular machinery uh, at atomic level, to extract its dynamics information, then uh, we want to ask a, a question about how to harvest, how to convert its dynamic information um, into therapeutic or drug discoveries. So previously, we only used kind of static structures to design drugs, but we know that many drugs that interact with some of the immediate state, transient state, or just change the energy landscape so if you have many structures, if you say you have 60 structures of a proteasome, 
how that's going to impact your drug discovery. I think that's a lot of things to uh, digest and a lot of information to really uh, make sense. Okay, so uh, briefly acknowledge my uh, group member and three heroes. Uh, first, uh, Yuan Chen Dong is now already, he was a poster in my lab um, a few years ago, and he's now a professor at the Institute of Chemistry of Chinese Academy of Sciences. And uh, Xu Wenzhang is now a poster in my lab, and he was um, my uh, graduate student who uh, did amazing work with Yuan Chen Dong uh, on the seven structures. And uh, Zhao Long Wu uh, is, is my current grad student uh, who developed the Alpha Cryo 4D that allow us to expand the seven structure into a, more than 60 structures. Um, and also I'd like to briefly acknowledge the uh, professor Mark Kirshner's group at really uh, collaboration with Mark's labs really got all these kind of proteasome started. So that's, uh, 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 I'm, I'm really uh, appreciated, uh, very uh, thankful uh, for um, this collaboration. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, that's all about uh, today's talk. Uh, any questions? Okay, wow. Thank you very much, Udon. That was an extraordinarily impressive tour of the proteasome. We have a couple of questions that have already come in. Um, and please, if you do have questions, please type it into the questions box. So um, we have one from Sergio Hibero, who is asking, are there any um, cell stress molecules or external toxins that could bind to the RPN proteins and therefore affect substrate recognition, folding or degradation? Uh, well, uh, I think there's, uh, well, I couldn't precisely answer this question. That's because uh, there's a large number of lab work, uh, uh, I, was, I would say a large number of protein networks is actually uh, regulating the proteasome function uh, upstream. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, there are proteins apparently involved in prepared substrates. For example, the CDC 48 in, in in yeast and uh, P97 in human, uh, kind of some of the substrate won't be able to have this initiation region ready for proteasome. Then the CDC48 uh, for uh, uh, the P97 is kind of prepared for, for it, right? Uh, so there's also other, uh, we believe that some of these, there's right now there's also uh, besides the extrinsic ubiquitin receptor like red 23 a b in human uh, ubiquitin there's four types of ubiquitin uh, that's apparently kind of a very responsive to kind of to some of the cellular stress we also know that uh, some of the e3 like for example the uh, ub 3 c four five they mm -hmm. they also kind of been uh, involved in this um, this folded protein response that kind of got involved in the function, regulating function of proteasome. So yeah, that's a very good question as actually match uh, my last slide that there's a whole lot of things going on between protein ubiquitination and, and proteasome degradation. Uh, so many proteins are actually indirectly or directly involved in the, the regulation of proteasome. And also we know that uh, the proteomes looks like kind of constantly being chemically modified post-translationally in response to certain uh, cellular stimuli. And when not fully understand it, uh, some of the phosphorylation really stimulates the activity and some of the uh, kind of modification instead kind of break it down. So uh, a very good question I would say, but those no. Uh, and the question actually represents uh, probably a whole new area in the future uh, to be explored. And right now, I think it's just uh, Thank you. many possibilities. Yeah. So we have another question from Betel Karademir, who is asking, do you think there's any situation where these 18 subunits are separated from the catalytic part? Um, can you restate what you mean? Which uh, subunit is separated from catalytic part? So the 
asking the 18 subunits in the regulatory proteasome, are they ever separated from the catalytic part? I think that's oh, the question. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, they are separated from the proteolytic active sites, which is actually sequestered, uh, concealed uh, inside a beta ring. It's uh, very deep down. Uh, let me just show you the slide. If, uh, if, uh, sorry, you, can, you cannot see slide, right? Okay, I'm just going to describe it. It's actually done in the, in the very deep part of the core particle in, inside a beta ring. So it's well separated from the regulatory particle, uh, that's for sure. But uh, of course, the regulatory particle itself has kind of uh, deep coordination active sites and ATP hydrolysis active sites um, also. But apparently these are protein, uh, the uh, enzymatic sites in a regulatory particle, it's clearly allosterically coupled to the uh, proteolytic side in the inside the uh, core particle. And that's actually a major conclusion, major conclusion of the bioarchive paper. We really see some of the coupling uh, going on there. And there's also, I would tell you, there's a series of paper from uh, Louis K's lab uh, in Canada. They were using uh, AMR show these kind of uh, long reach global uh, couplings all around the proteasome while well, they were showing it using uh, archaeo proteasome, but I think it's uh, quite true for the 20 success. Okay, great. And I think maybe along similar lines, uh, Pedro Fernandez has a question about whether the, the uh, a double capped proteasome can take two substrates at once. Um, yes, of course, yeah. Yes, uh, that's course. being seen, yeah, that's okay. being seen. Excellent, thank you. Um, and I think Sergio has another question um, that since the proteasome is really dynamic, do you have any data about the movement of different proteasome subunits while the proteasome is actually being formed or assembled or dismantled? So you're, you're looking at it as a whole holistic thing, right? But uh, um, have you got any data when it's when it's in process, if you see what he's asking? Um, so does that does it mean that in the process of assembly or in the process of functioning? Um, in the process of assembly, we do capture a uh, regular particle before it actually assembled and the uh, core particles. So that was a molecular cell paper. Um, and what is interesting is we found that if the whole regular particle was not assembled and the core particle it's ATPase is sample multiple conformations. It's actually sample continuous distribution of conformations. It doesn't stay still at all. Uh, yeah. And so um, I think I'm Yeah. Okay. I think um, I actually had one question, and then I was going to ask Jack's technical question. Uh, just um, out of curiosity, how many ATPs then do you need to destroy a substrate? Is it is it one per residue with that stroke that you're talking about? Every ATP hydrolysis is moving it down a substrate. Do we have a sense of how energy intensive destruction of a hundred amino acid substrate is? Uh, well, that a good question. Where um, um, I can break it down to this: uh, Why ATP hydrolysis based on the structure it looks like it's kind of move the substrate forward by two residues. Uh, so we kind of, we can, you know, we can kind of calculate probably um, if you say 100 amino acid, I would say at least uh, 50 around ATP. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay. So that's kind of, yeah. But uh, we know there's also, you probably need a, a few more ATP to get it started because the starting point is consuming more energy. Uh, as I show in the what I'm talking about is the mode three. The mode one actually, you move it once, you take two ATP. In mode three, you move it a two step, you only take one ATP one hydrolysis. ATP. So, okay. yeah. So a little bit more than that. And yeah. so uh, Jack Stubbs would like to know how you made the movies that you showed us of your time resolved cryo -EM. Well, uh, how we made the movies? Uh, first, you have to 
uh, duly data collection solve the seven structures, right? Uh, then it becomes very simple because the camera has a simple function. You, if you have a seven structure that is so close, it will simply interpolate, uh, uh, connect these seven structures into a movie. You don't need, because the structure is so close, so they can just interpret, interpolate the uh, trajectory of the atoms. Um, so that's how, how it was made. Uh, it's not made by molecular dynamic simulation. Just give Chimera, give UCSF Chimera the coordinates, then you would just uh, create a movie for you. Thanks. In minutes, very good. Excellent. All right, so that takes us to just gone three. So I would like to thank everybody for attending and I would really like to thank you, Yudong, for a superb presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, if you're not done with your questions yet, you can always continue the conversation online. Um, you can follow the uh, Twitter accounts that are shown here. Um, okay, and so just to, there's a few final wrap ups. We do welcome any suggestions that you might have for future topics, speakers to feature in this webinar series. So if you've got any ideas, we invite you to submit a proposal for a webinar and you can find more information um, at the website shown here. Please do join us for the next one in the series, which will be called Novel Advances in Signaling, Next Generation Approaches. And that takes place on the 10th of March at three o'clock GMT. And that one is part of our dedicated early career researcher series, and it will feature presentations from four early career researchers working in the field of signaling. And will be chaired by Dr. Amy Lewis, who is a postdoctoral research associate at Queen Mary University of London and a member of the Biochemical Society Early Career Advisory Panel. You can find out more about this and register on the website. And so, Obviously, this is an extraordinary time for all of us, um, and it's more important than ever that we stay connected to each other, uh, if only virtually. So it's also an exciting time to join the Biochemical Society as we're looking to expand the online activities. So I've been a member of the Society for many years now, and I take full advantage of the support that is offered, uh, particularly to attend meetings. Um, and as I have uh, you know, become more uh, established in my career, the freedom and the opportunity to organize meetings with society support, not just financial, but also um, administrative support. In all, uh, you can also apply to host seminar series um, and essentially the society facilitates and enables communication of science and formation of networks across multiple platforms. And you can join this community of researchers and specialists and take advantage of the key benefits, which include discounted registration fees, um, access to a wide range of grants and bursaries, personal online access to their journals and more. So please do visit the website to find out more. Thank you very much again for joining. It was a pleasure to chair this session. Um, I hope you have a good remainder of the day, whatever time it is with you. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.